and only mode. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's just now um, noon on the West Coast, 11 o'clock in Alaska, and we're going to wait just about a minute before we uh, introduce the webinar. So if you'll stand by, we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, well, good morning, folks. I have just about one minute after 11 here so we uh, in Alaska, so we want to go ahead and get started. It looks like folks are still logging in, but uh, my name is Jim Pfeifenberger, and I am a member of the Pacific Ocean Education Team, or POET uh, group, and we're happy to sponsor uh, this series of webinars that focus on ocean <laughs> science and research. And... Uh, We'll get to the webinar in just a minute, but I would like to tell you that um, the Pacific Ocean Education Team was established in uh, March of 2008, and it's an interdisciplinary team. It's also a bi-regional, meaning uh, we have members from the Pacific West region and the Alaska region, and we work together to coordinate uh, interpretive ocean stewardship efforts in both regions. We have a number of purposes that we came together. I'll just share a couple of them with you. We uh, want to support and align ocean stewardship work with other regions and national efforts. We also work with partners to conduct ongoing needs assessments for formal, informal, uh, educational efforts and media outreach. And we suggest, test, and promote new and innovative methods to provide a broad range of interpretive and education outreach for ocean stewardship to the widest possible audience. And that, of course, is where this uh, webinar series sort of fits in, trying to reach a wide audience with a variety of marine science and research uh, topics. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have Russell Gallipo, the superintendent of Channel Islands National uh, Park, with us. And we'll turn it over to him in just a moment here. But I did also want to make you aware that we uh, are trying to do these webinars every couple of months. So we have uh, our next one scheduled for the 18th of January, and that will be Patrick Bernard presenting on coastal vulnerability to climate change on the north central California coast. More details will be forthcoming, and so look for an announcement uh, and registration for that webinar um, after the, uh, sh shortly after the first of the year. Okay, before I turn it over to Russell, I do want to uh, give John Morris uh, just a moment. He is the wizard behind the curtain, so to speak, who controls the IT part of this, and uh, we'll let him introduce some of the technical aspects of the webinar before we get going. John? Thanks, thanks Jim. Yeah, this is the John Morris. I work in the regional office here in Anchorage. I'm helping to facilitate the workshop. But anyone who's new to go to webinar software, it works pretty simply. You can listen to the audio over your telephone or over your computer. Uh, if you have comments or questions uh, throughout the session, you can just type them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Because there's so many people online, we can't open up the mic to everybody. So this is a way for you to communicate with us, uh, both in asking questions and comments. If you happen to lose the audio temporarily, that may be a bandwidth issue. Just stand by and should return uh, shortly. So that uh, normally we have very few problems with this. But if you do have technical issues or questions, feel free to just type them in the box, and I'll, I'll be monitoring and help out if I can. Okay, thanks, John. Yeah, I'll be monitoring the box as well. As a general rule, um, we'll let Russell uh, complete his presentation and save uh, most of the questions for Russell uh, for the end, so we will have a question answer opportunity at the end. So once again, Russell Gallopo is a superintendent at Channel Islands National Park. We're very fortunate to have him because, as we all know, these superintendents are very busy uh, 
people with busy schedules, and we're very uh, feel very fortunate that Russell carved out a little time to share some information with us today. So I'll turn it over to Russell Gallopo. Okay, thanks, Jim, and thanks, John. And looking at the attendees, I can see that uh, I know what some of my staff is doing today, too. So this will be interesting to hear your feedback. So welcome, and uh, let's talk a little bit about marine protected areas. And uh, as, as has been lined out, we'll ask some questions toward the end. So what I'm going to uh, try and do today is go through basically what are marine protected areas, what are marine reserves. For some of you, that's going to be a new term. And why do we need marine reserves? And what goes into the creation of a marine reserve? What are the benefits of a marine reserve? And then some helpful resources. And then we'll have some time for questions. So let's get started. What are marine protected areas? Now, what we learned is that there was an executive order that was actually passed in May of 2000 under the Clinton administration that said uh, the purpose was to strengthen the management, protection, and conservation of, the, of existing marine protected areas. So if you are in a park or out there and you are on the coastline and you have area, your boundary goes into the ocean or if it happens to go into a Great Lake, if you're in the Great Lakes area, you are a marine protected area. You may not be part of a marine protected identified area through the National Marine uh, Protected Areas Center, but you as a park if you involve marine resources or Great Lake resources, the water itself, you are a marine protected area. It also says that we're to develop a scientifically based comprehensive national system of marine protected areas. And more importantly, we're to try and avoid harm of these areas. Now, I think what's important in looking at this are a couple of key terms. And the first is a marine protected area. A marine protected area means any area of the marine environment that has been reserved by federal, state, territorial, tribal, or local laws or regulations to provide for lasting protection. So when we look at the marine environment, this means any area of coastal or ocean waters and the Great Lakes and that they're connecting water and their connecting waters, submerged lands there under in which the United States exercises jurisdiction consistent with international law. And of course, the United States means you know, all those uh, areas such as US territories also. So within the United States, only about 1% of the oceans and Great Lakes are set aside as marine protected areas. Now, when you look at a marine protected area, most of you will realize that if your boundary goes out into the ocean or into a Great Lake, is that you do allow uses, especially things like extractive uses, what I mean here is fishing. So you do have rules and regulations that are set up, and we call this course the fishing regulations. And so that means if you are in a marine protected area, your national park or national preserve or a national historic site that goes into the marine environment and you're allowing fishing, you are a marine protected area, but you are actually managing for single species management. You're not doing ecosystem-based management under this definition. So that's why everybody start looking at this idea of marine reserves. Now, a marine reserve is a type of a marine protected area. So case in point, Channel Islands National Park, it is a marine protected area. But marine reserves are more specific. Specifically, they are areas in which there is no take, meaning no take of anything, no take of the geology, no take of the plant life, no take of the animal life, no take zones. Now, having no take zones, you start looking at these areas more like your national parks. Now, I realize many national parks, if not all of them, have recreational fishing inside of them. But in the case of a marine reserve, we're saying no take means no take of everything. So you can actually start to look at an ecosystem-based management approach, which is the last time I went through our policies for the National Park Service, it's the word ecosystem-based management agency. So marine reserves are a direction that we should 
clearly be looking at going. And we do have several examples of uh, marine reserves in the National Park System. Uh, Channel Islands are listed here, Virgin Islands, Buck Island. But there's also in the Everglades, uh, and there's also Point Reyes, and there's even Cabrillo National Monument. So when you think of these areas, uh, you, you might think naturally of the national parks, but there's places like Cabrillo, whose boundary extends into the ocean, in which there has been established marine reserves. Now it gets a little tricky. Every once in a while I might say marine protected area. Sometimes I'll say marine reserve, but I'm really trying to keep all my conversation to the specifics called marine reserves, because any political boundary that goes into the water in which the United States of America has some jurisdiction, or maybe the state that's been set aside for some protection is a marine protected area, but it's not fully protected unless it's called a marine reserve. So here's Channel Islands. This will give you some idea of what it looks like. And I want you to focus in on Santa Rosa Island right in the middle of your picture. And you'll see you have these, uh, I think you can, you can see my cursor around Santa Rosa Island. And this first line that comes out to here is actually the jurisdiction within the state of California. So the state claims this under their jurisdiction. The park boundary actually goes out one mile into the ocean. So just sort of drawing an area that's about one mile off. So that's still the national park. So it's the island, and the one mile around each of the islands is a national park. This darker line on the outside is the National Marine Sanctuary, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So within this black line is a marine protected area. But more specifically in the Channel Islands, these boxes indicate a marine reserve. These are no-take areas, okay, no-take, meaning no fishing, no extraction of any kind. Everywhere else where it's white is a marine protected area, but you are allowed to fish. So you have ecosystem management going on in these boxes or marine reserves, and in all this white area, you've got single species management where basic fishing regulations apply. Fishing regulations here, no take, no fishing here. All right, so why do we need these things? Well, I think many of you heard since you've been involved with POET for a while is that there's a tremendous amount of stress on the ocean, a lot from urban development. You know, a lot of the West Coast and a lot of the Atlantic uh, Coast is all developed, all up and down. And of course, with development, you have the loss of habitats. Uh, on the mainland, but also have impacts into the uh, ocean uh, habitats. And of course, associated with all this development is also pollution and waste. So you get development, you got the pollution, you got the waste, the chemical runoff that goes along with this. And then one of the largest culprits that's hurting our ocean is overfishing. Uh, I was just looking at some fishing statistics for our area, and I was looking at the uh, the millions of pounds of squid that are actually harvested within Channel Islands National Park within a marine protected area, but not within a marine reserve. So there's lots of threats going on with oceans, but one of the beauties of setting up these marine reserves is that you can start to establish basin. So what does it look like? underwater. What should it look like? Now, granted, there's some problems with the picture I'm showing you here. These are abalone. And this is what the Channel Islands used to look like. They were covered with abalone. Now, one of the problems with this picture is sea otters have been out of the uh, ecosystem as part of that equation for well over 100 years. So would we see this abundance naturally if the sea otter was in the picture? Probably not. But we still see very high densities of abalone in Northern California, where there are also sea otters present. What has happened over the years is we've seen the uh, population or the density of these abalone start to decline. So here you see lots of abalone. So let me go through a little bit of uh, storytelling here. So we look at and, and why it's important to have these marine reserves, these no-take areas set up as baselines. So if you look at commercial landings of abalone uh, 
in California, you'll see that through the 1960s we had the peak and then we start to see this dramatic decline. Now what's happening here, we are measuring the landings. So the animals have already been removed from the system and basically the damage has been done. They are now dead. They've been removed from the ecosystem. So we look at this over time by just doing the traditional fisheries management, which is we measure at the dock what's been taken. And when we look at all five abalone species in Southern California, this is what we see. And you notice all by 1990 to 2000, we see a, a depletion of all five species of abalone. Now, primarily, this is all being driven by over-harvest or fishing. Now, there's also a, uh, a withering foot syndrome, a disease that's also going through the population. But to take it down this quickly was, a, was the aid of fishermen doing this. You know, fishermen don't necessarily stop when they run out of one resource or they close one resource. Is the, in our case, the abalone fishermen were also at the bottom and they were looking at another commodity, which was the Red Sea urchin. So now you see the opposite. On the left side of this graph, you see uh, red urchin harvesting. And where you would have had the majority of the harvesting going on was abalone. You have the decline of abalone, and then you have the same urchin, I mean, uh, abalone divers who now become urchin divers, and you see the increase of the take of urchins. So just last year, red urchins alone, most of them taken out of Channel Islands National Park, was about uh, 2.5 million pounds. So they each uh, legal urchin weighs about one pound. So that's about uh, you know, 200, I mean 2 million 500 urchins. That might seem like a lot of urchins, but uh, this is where monitoring and marine reserves come into play is you know, is that really a lot, or are we seeing in the marine reserves, which are going to take, which are going to take areas, um, are we having significant impacts on the ecosystem? Now, why monitoring becomes an important part of using these marine reserves as baseline is that when you look at uh, abalone here, in this case, and you look at fishermen who measure everything by catch per unit effort, you can see in this graph how they see things as very steady. But you start looking underwater and looking at the resource and you follow what the scientist sees and you can see that 10 years before the decline in this fishery, scientists were already starting to see a problem uh, with a fishery that's, uh, that's, that's heading into big trouble. So this is a uh, you know, big push for monitoring, but it's also still trying to keep on that line of why you have to have these areas of no take so you have something to compare with. So with some of that story, I want to go into, so how do you create a, a marine reserve? And uh, the big thing here is always data, 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 more data, and then of course it's understanding. And what I mean by the understanding part is, it's what is it that you need to know and how do you learn about all that? And then how do you share all that with a variety of people to try and make good decisions? Now, in the National Park Service, we've got several databases. And some of you probably are contributing to those databases. I know my staff is. <clears throat> but there's, so there's a national, there's a park level. But what's really more important is that you share that data with everybody else. So when you go into this idea of how do you make your marine protected area a better place, which is making a marine reserve, what resources are going into that decision making to try and establish a ecosystem-based ocean program? So just like you use GIS on the mainland, they've been perfecting how do you use geographic information systems underwater. And for years, they've been looking at habitat and biology, physical, cultural resources, and even what's more important here is social economic resources. And how do you put that all together try and come up with an approach to creating this idea of marine reserves or these no-take areas within a marine protected area. And it's that layering of data that becomes really important to help decision makers figure out where is the best place to put these resources or to put these ideas of marine reserves and what are the trade-offs? What happens if you put them there? Who wins? Who loses? 
ecosystem wins, but do sometimes fishermen lose, or do fishermen win, and sometimes the ecosystem lose? <clears throat> so this is really a very uh, complex uh, process of sitting around the table with stakeholders, in which uh, I see some of you on the call today were stakeholders in some of these processes, where we sit around and we actually look at all these tools that we have at our fingertips, and I'm going to show you one in a second, the marine map, is then how do you sit around and make these decisions and look at the trade-offs of how do you protect these ocean resources using this new tool called, called uh, marine reserves. So before we even do that, we look at how, how is it that you set up a marine reserve and what is it that you look at that makes sure that these areas are going to work. The, the literature is telling us that when you set up these marine reserves, the bigger they are, the better they are, and most of the literature would suggest that we should set up of any given area somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of that area should be a no fishing area. Well, here we're very fortunate in California that a group of scientists have gotten together and they've created these science guidelines for how we go about creating these special marine protected areas called marine reserves what goes into those and what are the considerations that we as stakeholders have to consider when we're creating these marine reserves, these very special special protected areas. So the first thing we look at is, is habitat. And with habitat, we want to make sure that we have replication of habitat within each biogeographic region. Now, I was part of what was called the South Coast region. But even that, the Channel Islands were a little bit different than the mainland. But you want to make sure you have a good representation of habitats within that bioregion. And then what they, the scientists have also told us is that you have to set aside enough habitat within each of these areas to include 90% of the biological diversity. Now, you don't always necessarily get to do this because if you've been if you're in an area that's been heavily fished for a long, long period of time, clearly you're not going to have 90%. Uh, you're going to have something less than that. But what you're trying to do is get all those components of the habitat all in one place so that all the other pieces of the ecosystem will have a chance to recover. Size means everything in setting up these marine reserves or these ecosystem-based management areas and then space it. So you have to make sure that when we set aside an area and have it established as a marine reserve, is that it's large enough to encompass adult movement of species. But it, they also have to be in proximity to one another so that if there's larval disbursement, is that what are the chances that the larval disbursement will settle out in another marine reserve so that they are protected. So if we continue to just have larval disbursement out of a marine reserve, all these larvae uh, or larvae settle and uh, pressure on that area, well, as those larvae evolve and grow up into adults, they're just going to be harvested and may not contribute back to the ecosystem. So you're looking at also the connectivity. You're building a network. So one area, especially if it's a small area, isn't necessarily going to help a network or a system. It can only maybe help that one particular area. So we looked at things, or the science panel made looked at things such as a longshore span. You know, how big of an area do we need to look at? And through all the research that has been done here in, in California, we find out that we need about three to six miles of coastline that are set up in a protected area. And we know that the, the bigger they are, again, the better they are, especially for bigger, is that you want to take into consideration other species that can benefit. We have a tendency to always think about the fish or the invertebrates or the algae or plant life that's inside the water, but we forget about the marine birds and the marine mammals and we forget about migratory fish. So the larger a system can be, the more components of that ecosystem can be met by that marine reserve or that no-take area. So what we 
the scientists had done is they looked at a variety of fish species, and I just put this little scatter diagram out there for you to give you some idea of uh, what species benefit with in a uh, size, or this is basically their home range size. But what they have found in California, that 76% of the species, especially those that are, many of those that are fish, is that they actually um, are in sort of that one to 10 kilometer home range area. So I, I put this black line in here because this is a sort of an indication of everything to the left, you know, is really benefited, uh, benefits more and, and we help set a standard of saying, okay, how big should they be along shore so that we can protect as many species as possible. But if you make it too large to where you're trying to protect all the pelagic fish, you start running into other problems with how do you set up this ecosystem and, and balance with all the other uses of the ocean. And, and again, they look at uh, dispersal, larval dispersal. And again, I put in this, uh, this little box in the middle. You see the, the lines that, that uh, go vertically in the middle is establishing uh, what is sort of the, the size of the, uh, the area that's necessary to protect uh, the dispersal of some of these invertebrates. So when you look at uh, things like lobsters and crabs and some of these uh, fish, once again we see that uh, you want to make sure that you have adequate sized marine reserves, but you also want to space these reserves um, close enough to one another so that they can benefit by some dispersal uh, settling in these other areas. So you see a recommendation here is that they should be within 50 to 100 kilometers of one another or 30 to 60 miles apart. So it seems like a long way, but you can remember there's a lot of dispersal that goes on in the ocean and these guys are subject to a lot of uh, current injury. So I'm going to uh, show you a little bit about how we use some of this uh, information and I hope the moderator will jump in if uh, the screen didn't just come up and change. It should look, it should be a, a different map called marine map. Actually, Matt, there. Can you tell me that's Russell, did yeah. you see it? There it is. It did it, 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 yes. delay, but it is here. Yeah, it's there. Okay. So I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes on this. And we, so all that data we put together, I showed you, um, is that we have a tool in California called Marine Map, and I understand they're starting to use it in Oregon and Washington and some on the Atlantic coast. But this uh, box to your left is I can go in and I can start to uh, identify things that I think are are important to me uh, and, and trying to make a decision of how do we create a marine reserve. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Cabrillo, which is down here, Cabrillo National Monument at the end of Point Loma. And one of the things I know that I'm real interested in is if I want to protect habitat, I want to look at uh, things like uh, kelp forest. I see that uh, Ben's on the line here. So uh, I'm going to try and find where I have kelp. Uh, and here we go, we're going to have persisting kelp. And what you're going to see is this starts to map that for me. Is this is where I, this is one of the most productive habitats. This is the La Jolla area and this is Point Loma area. And again, as I say, Cabrillo National Monument is right here. I know this is a high productive area and we, and we know that Cabrillo has a really nice tide pool and we know that their boundary goes out into the water. We know that hundreds of, I mean, actually millions of people come to visit Cabrillo, and this is a great place to educate people about the benefits of marine areas, but more specifically, marine reserves. So I start looking at this place and start to say, well, how important really is Cabrillo? And kelp is one of the big ecosystems that are important in Southern California. Very productive, and has high biodiversity and high productivity. So I identify and I see, ooh, there is a lot of kelp around this area. And it does come over to the new shore. This is just how it's depicted uh, in this particular map. But there's other things I may want to know when I take a look at this. And so let's see. Um, so if we were to protect this, are we going to get any uh, seabird uh, protection out of this? And we do know there are seabirds around Point Loma. But when we look at the importance of seabirds, it doesn't look like it's all that high for that area. So I'm going to click that off. But maybe I'm interested to know how uh, people use this area. So let's take a look at recreational fishing. And then we start to see 
oh, it looks like there's a lot of use in this area. We start to see big uses here. In fact, let me expand this box so you, you'll know a little bit what goes into this. You have you know, spear fishing, which I don't see here, but we have fishing piers and jetties, things to keep in mind. But we have kayak launch sites, and so we do know that kayakers who launch here will come down and fish down in this area, and kayakers who launch here and here will go fish this area and vice versa. So we start to get a handle on how people are using these resources over time. And there's lots of other things. I'm going to show you one more we can uh, put on here. I just want to give you an idea of how we can take a look at uh, marine map to help make decisions about where best to look at productive ecosystems, but also uh, to put it in balance with protecting uh, uh, other users that are out there. Okay, I need to minimize this. And I'm going to call up some uh, what we call ecotrust data. Now this is where we start to ask, in this particular case, I want to know where commercial passenger fishing vessels fish that are coming out of San Diego and they're going for calico bass, which is in the kelp forest. And so what we see here through this mapping tool is that if I'm very interested in creating a marine reserve down off of Point Loma, which is right here, Cabrillo National Monument, I also know that the darker the color, this goes from this red down out to yellow, this is less used, this is heavily used, that the recreational fishing fleets heavily use this area. So as you can imagine, sitting across the table with a stakeholder, these are going to be tough areas for us to work on together of trying to decide, is it in the best interest to put a, uh, some sort of a, a marine protected area, but more specifically a marine reserve down here to protect Cabrillo National Monument and all the purposes it was set aside, but also protect all the other interests in this area and protect the ecosystem in general. So I want to give you some idea of this interactive map that's been developed out of the uh, University of California in uh, Santa Barbara that could be coming your way. And as more of you learn about spatial planning, this will be one of the tools that's out there for us all to understand how our resources are being used and what are those resources that occur in the ocean right in my backyard. Okay, so now I'm going to flip back to my PowerPoint. So another thing that's really important when we look at these, uh, again, for the ecosystem purposes, you need to know how these areas are being used by birds and uh, mammals. So a little bit of a uh, recap here is that when you look at marine protected areas and more specifically marine reserves, and again, I'm going to continue to push this idea of marine reserves, this idea of having no-take areas within our national parks, so we're actually doing truly ecosystem management, is we know we're not going to be able to close off the entire park or the national monument, but we need to be able to set up something in the future that is going to protect these ecosystems. So you need to keep in mind the bioregions you're in, you need to understand the key marine habitats, and then you need to go from shallow water to deep water, including the intertidal area, you need to look at something that's around three to six miles in length along the shore. And then you want to make sure your spacing of protected areas or reserves are somewhere between 30 to 60 miles apart. Now, closer is fine, but you don't want to go any further than 60 miles out and recommend that really you stay around 30 miles in distance. So even if one set up outside of your park boundary, you want to try and put that one that's outside or encourage one that's outside to be in proximity to your boundary so you can reap some of those benefits and vice versa. And of course, that have some replicates. So this is what it looks like down in Southern California. Uh, so we went from uh, somewhere around 1% uh, of marine reserves in Southern California to now about 10% in Southern California. In fact, 10% statewide now. So all the red areas are marine reserves, which means no take. The blue areas are marine conservation areas, which again are single species management. But uh, if you look here at Anacapa, which is right here, Anacapa Island, this area here is closed. It's been closed for about 
well, part of it's been closed for about 30 years. And this is a conservation area, which I believe they only allow them to take a spiny lobster. Everything else is banned for the take. And of course, again, all this other area, this white area, is still a marine protected area, but it's subject to the rules and regulations of fish and game. So it's single species management. Here it's still single species management. But here it's ecosystem management because we're trying to have all the components of the ecosystem protected for in hopefully in perpetuity. So as you can see here, uh, the Santa Monica Mountains uh, here. And then down here uh, we have Point Loma. And you can see there's a little piece. Uh, you can, it doesn't even show up on the scale map. Uh, that we were able to establish a marine reserve off of the Cabrillo National Monument. So what are the benefits? Well, there's lots of benefits to having marine reserves, and we have been very fortunate here in the Channel Islands to have had one reserve in, uh, in existence for over 30 years. So I'll tell you, talk a little bit about that one, but I'll talk about benefits in general. So. When we look at the Anacapa Reserve, uh, one of the um, things we run into out here in the Channel Islands is if you have an over-harvest of predators, so in which that's most of the fish, by the way, comes from the predators, is that you see things like purple urchins who then uh, eat the kelp forest rise in populations. Uh, so the purple urchins, which nobody harvests, the harvest urchins in the park are red urchins. The purples are not harvested. So what you see over time in the Anacapa Reserve is that the purple urchin population, which has no checks outside the re I mean, has, yeah, really has no checks outside the reserve because a lot of the predators, large lobsters and large fish, have been taken by fishermen. You can see how the purple urchin goes up and then comes down. Usually it's uh, then... Uh, disease factors from overpopulation, and then they die out and they go back up. If you look inside the reserve where you have that balance of predator and prey, you can see the purple urchin stays pretty level. And where you see these little up swings is uh, where we can document we had El Nino uh, uh, effects inside the park. This is another good reason to have baseline and to have these marine reserves is you have these areas to compare to the, the rest of your, your marine protected area or your park. We also saw this with pink abalone, as you can look at in the fishing zone, that yellow, you can see how the decline occurs, but then you look at the Anacapa Reserve and you can see where there is no fishing that the pink abalone stay fairly steady over time. Now, this is real data that, that has come out of uh, Channel Islands National Park. So were the previous two, by the way. Uh, real data, and uh, this is from Scott Hamilton, who's now at Moss Landing with Cal State University System. And what we see here is we're looking inside and outside reserves. So again, here you have a marine protected area, Ten Islands National Park, surrounded by a sanctuary. That's a marine protected area. But how protected really is it if you don't have marine reserves? And here's a case that shows you really haven't protected it all that much without having an area that has no take areas, these marine reserves. So in this particular case, you can take a look at uh, the graph speaks for itself. But you can see that the sheephead and the kelp bass, um, also ocean white fish and the rock, olive rock fish, uh, they are all larger inside the reserve. And then you have the others that uh, are no difference in size. So we're definitely seeing size differences inside the reserve. Now these reserves that we're comparing here have only been closed for uh, going on eight years now. Eight years, we're already starting to see the size difference and the benefits of having no fishing within a marine reserve. Uh, we just look at the California sheephead itself, and now we look island-wide. So you see Santa Barbara, uh, we don't see any difference, but in Anacapa and Santa Cruz, once again, inside these marine reserves, we're seeing larger fish. Santa Rosa, no difference. And then San Miguel, we see no difference. But it's also important to note we're also getting close to their northern range, where they're already in low abundance. Uh, and there's another way of looking at this data and, and showing where you're seeing 
inside and outside. So the red is inside, and you can see there's a general trend for larger uh, fish than, than there is outside. And here again, we look at kelp bass, and we start seeing the same thing. So basically, we're seeing the same trend over and over again. Inside the marine reserves, we're seeing larger animals. Uh, and then outside, we're seeing less. Why do we see less outside? Because they're being fished. Now, you can't always look at the animals that are fished. Sometimes you have to look at the animals that aren't fished. And this shows you that what would you expect inside a marine reserve? The animals that aren't fished, you shouldn't see that many of them because you're going to have their or predators inside the reserve eating them. And outside, you might see them increase because there aren't as many predators. And that's what we start to see here, is that inside, uh, you'll see some things like uh, maybe some more, uh, well, there's either differences or, or, or not. So let me get to my right piece of paper here. I'm sorry, I have a box that's blocking my data. But you can, you can see here with some of these uh, species that you'll see more juveniles outside. And of course, you might see them outside the marine reserve because you have less predators on the outside. Or on the inside, you're going to have more of that balance of the, uh, of the predators in the prey. And here's another way to look at this is if you look at the uh, average targeted species and you look at the ones that are, it looks like orange to me, that are targeted versus non-targeted, you can see that outside the reserve to your left, you don't have that as much diversity. And then the fish you're really trying to protect, the targeted ones, the ones that are fish, that also can benefit out of reserves because the reserve is the right size to take up the majority of their home range. And so you see much more benefit or lots of benefit inside the reserves. And you ask my divers, uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell you that when they go through most of these areas where there's reserves, they see a dramatic difference. In fact, we now hear from the dive boat captains who are bringing recreational divers out there, even if they're coming out there for uh, lobster season, if they'd like to go to the Anacapa Reserve and show their clients what it looks like to be in an area that's been closed to fishing for a period of time and then take them outside. And the divers themselves can see the big difference. They can see the benefits of having these areas that are set aside future generations. Basically. Now, none of this can happen. You know, you can do all the biology all you want, and you can set up these reserves. You can have all this great intent, but if you don't follow it up with enforcement, you have nothing. And I know this is always going to be a struggle with us in the, the park service, and I know it is with Fish and Game, is how do you put the ranger on the water? And how do you check enough boats? And how do you make sure the ranger knows all the different fish species? How do you make sure that the divers know that they're inside a reserve and outside a reserve? And so a large education piece has to continue uh, for this whole process. So no enforcement. It doesn't matter where you have marine reserves or even marine protected areas. No enforcement, no success. So. I know I've been talking for quite a while, but uh, I know this program will be available. Here are some uh, re resources I would encourage you to look up and uh, read about. They talk a lot about marine reserves. They cover a lot of what I have said today. Um, and there are several people that I want to acknowledge, uh, from the people who created Marine Map, Will McClintock, to Scott Hamilton, who did a lot of the data analysis and has been continuing to do a lot of data analysis for Carolina National Park. Many of the photos were from National Geographic and, of course, my staff. But, you know, to wrap this all up and before I open it up for questions is you got to have the science, you got to have the monitoring, you got to have the enforcement. But it still comes down to do people even know about what's going on. And I'm going to put a plug in here for uh, Channel Island, which is an underwater live program we've been doing here at the park for over 20 years. And uh, this, this program uh, was set up to bring the marine environment right to the person sitting in their, at their desk or sitting at home or even sitting in the classroom, and more specifically sitting in the classroom. I set a goal of having this program viewed uh, from as far away as Nebraska. 
and uh, we have achieved that. We've now entered into the Internet 2 world, uh, bringing the ocean world to the greater part of the American public and talking about this idea of marine reserves. And in fact, just last month, we broadcast uh, live for a short period of time because of the technology uh, broke out uh, out of contact, but uh, we broadcast live to Chile at a uh, workshop which included uh, marine resources, which I was a part of. So with that, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to open it up for some questions. And thanks for listening and for your patience. First time I've done one of these, and uh, I would say this is an interesting challenge. I think it would be better if you uh, interpret the folks who are doing this instead of me. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Russell. We appreciate your time. Yeah, it's a little different talking to a disembodied audience where you can't see anybody, but we know you're out there because we can see we have a list of attendees. And if you do have questions, um, this is the time to type them into the question box, um, and I'll read them off so that the a whole group can hear them, and uh, we'll give Russell a chance to respond to them. So take just a minute to let some of those questions come in, and... Uh, I do uh, once again thank you, Russell, for the presentation. It's great to hear that uh, you know that message that uh, yes, the science, of course, is critical to creating these things. But without the education piece as well, um, they don't get created. So the, the two really do have to work hand in hand to achieve uh, these goals that uh, that I think we all share as uh, conservation-minded employees. Um, another note I will tell you is that these webinars are recorded and available for. Uh, listening to later, they'll be on the Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center website. That's www.oceanalaska.org. And uh, let's start with a question we have here uh, from Amanda Walner. It says, uh, how do we get access to the Marine Map program? Okay, so right now Marine Map is uh, still uh, proprietary. I did give you, uh, I believe I gave you a link. Um, I can go backwards. Um, let me try this again. Uh, yeah, I did give you a link to Marine Map, so you can demo it. Uh, but then you have to then contact them to get access, so you can actually play with it and call up all the different themes. Because it was developed as a tool for the Marine Life Protection Act, for the purposes of the of stakeholder group to make recommendations to a Blue Ribbon Task Force, who in turn made recommendations to the California Fish and Game Commission on where to establish these marine reserves. So I did give you a, a link in the helpful resources, and uh, you can get on that and play around with it without, I think, being a member of it, but it is still proprietary uh, software, but they'll tell you how you can get access to it and how to get a log on, um, log on uh, ID. Great. Another question related to that mapping tool is um, that uh, does the mapping tool give you any idea of the data quality for each layer that you click on? Yeah, actually, um, the, it goes through a, a rigorous data quality review process, so uh, nothing can just arbitrarily be put in. And, and in fact, when you're drawing these maps, too, uh, when you get to the drawing phase and there's a drawing tool in there, it will actually start to tell you how well you're doing in meeting the goals that have been set up. So if you're trying to uh, replicate habitats, it will tell you if you're replicating them and uh, how much kelp do you have in it, how much linear kelp or, or how many uh, other attributes. So it's set up to actually do measurements also. And then it helps you tell you know, distances. So Hey, that one's uh, further than 60 miles apart, so you're not going to reap the benefits of uh, uh, spacing if you have them this far apart. Great, thank you. Here's another question. This is from Carissa Turner. It says, how are the marine reserve areas delineated in the water, and are there education efforts to inform the public? A great question. That's actually... Uh, been a uh, an issue here. Um, in some places on the mainland, they are delineated by signs. You know, they'll just put signs in the ground and say, from this point on, is a marine reserve, and there's it's a no-take zone. Our concern in the national park is we start to worry about aesthetics. So we've had a lot of the fishing community who are traveling anywhere from 12 to 50 miles offshore to get out to the national park is they would like to see range markers put up on the islands. And I have thought this uh, 
over time and saying, although that's very nice that I would mark the boundary, the idea is for these areas to be protected. So there's nothing illegal about fishing on the boundary of a marine reserve. So what I'm doing is a long answer to why I don't want to mark the boundaries. And they are marked, by the way, uh, through maps. You can buy map layers and put into your uh, GPS unit for your, your vessel. And they'll show you exactly where they are with the coordinates. And then the, on the website for Fish and Game, they have the coordinates. And we're trying to get Fish and Game to put the maps back in the Fish and Game rule book because they took those out. But every ranger who goes around hands out a map to everybody they come across. But the reason I don't mark them and I don't want to mark them as one is who's going to maintain these markers and then when you go out three miles, because most of these will go out three miles, some will go out six miles, how do you mark six miles out uh, with a buoy system so that people know they're in and how do they know if they're only three miles out? You don't want to create a whole line of buoys and you don't necessarily want to encourage people to fish on your line because if they're fishing your line, there's a good chance that you have line drift and they would actually be fishing inside of the reserve. And the only way you could prove that is if a ranger comes up to that boat, puts on their dive equipment, dives in the water, follows that line to make a determination whether they're in the reserve or not. So if I was ever forced to mark the boundaries, and there are fishermen who would like me to do that, I would want to mark the boundaries outside to take in, to consider line drift, but that's illegal. You have to mark the boundary where the boundary is. So, we don't mark them. They are available through all the navigational mapping tools, and they're available online. And uh, a big part of is education, and the ranger has to know where the boundaries are, and the ranger has to be uh, really good at working with the public and explaining to them where the boundaries are and where when they enforce things and when they don't. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, here's another one. It's all about jurisdiction, of course, or a willing partner. At California Fish and Game, in your case, which one of these allowed the establishment of no-take areas? Okay, so the uh, in our case, we have a, a little play by uh, a federal and a state agency that makes it a better situation. But the push really comes from the park. Even though we, we were very unique in other parks, we actually had a Supreme Court ruling from back in 1978 that made it clear that the state of California managed the marine life within the boundaries of the park. Well, that did not um, prevent us from monitoring inside the park to determine what was happening with the marine resources. So we started asking questions, and uh, we started showing data that said there's something going on, and we need a new tool. We cannot continue to, to manage the ecosystem based on the harvest of species. So. Uh, the state uh, worked with us first and, uh, and actually worked with the National Marine Sanctuary to establish uh, a state regulation with inside the boundary of the park and the state waters that surround the islands. So it was a partnership of doing that. Later in the federal waters, which are three miles out, the, uh, the National Marine Sanctuary added to the existing state marine reserves so some of them were actually extended, and some new ones were actually created in the federal waters that had no relationship except for spacing with the ones that were established by the state. So jurisdiction is important, but if you can document and you can show that your resources are being impacted and you are not doing ecosystem management, I believe it is your responsibility to step up and say, we've got to do something. Great, very good. Okay, we've got a few more here. Um, this one says, with, with some of the living examples of the older reserves, are you finding that the positions or responses of some of the stakeholders is shifting? Specifically, are you able to make the case to consumptive users that having reserves as sources or buffers is in their interest too? Uh, yes, uh, as I said to the uh, program maybe not too clear. We do know dive boats uh, who are primarily going out there to harvest uh, lobster, especially this time of year, is that they do stop at the end of the Anacapa Reserve and show everybody what the ecosystem looks like where there's no take. So what do they see? Really big lobsters. They see lots of kelp. They see lots of big fish. They see really a very, very rich 
uh, community out there, and then you just go outside the reserve and they, where they can harvest the lobsters, they see a very, very different ecosystem. All the same habitat components are there, at least structure-wise, but not all the plants and animals are there. So we are seeing that that shift of understanding and support. And believe it or not, there are some of the folks in the commercial industry uh, fishing who are saying, yeah, yeah, but what do you expect? There's no fishing there, so you would expect to see you know, more fish. Uh, so we are getting some buy-in. I think the, the biggest uh, disablers right now are the sport fishermen uh, because they're seen as we took away their private fishing areas all along the state of California. But uh, you know, there's lots of areas that are rich, and Marine Map is really good because it can show you where all these rich habitats exist. So one area may have been excluded from fishing, but there's lots of other areas in Marine Map can clearly show where those areas are. Okay. Another one, with America's Cup coming to San Francisco next year, are there special considerations needed regarding marine protected areas connected to the national parks in the area? Russell, I believe we're getting some static from your microphone. I don't know if it's rubbing something or... All right, I moved it, moved it off my face. Okay, great. Is that better? Yes, much better. I should ask you to do that at the very beginning. <laughs> So did you get that question about the America's Cup? Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, boating, we haven't seen much impact from boating itself. Uh, where you are going to look at it is if they're setting up markers and things of that nature of where, where are they putting them down. So one of the things, you know, I'd be looking out for in, in a marine map, and I know there is a marine map up in that area, uh, whether you have a marine reserve uh, and I don't think they've done that, the Golden Gate area, yet. Uh, I know they've done up at Point Reyes. But uh, I would be very sensitive to where you might have uh, eelgrass beds or any kind of seagrass beds because those are the areas that if you drop a, a buoy system down and if you don't uh, somehow elevate the chain, you're going to get a large scouring and you're going to lose some very sensitive and very valuable habitat. So I would say Marine Map could be a great tool, at least in spatial playing, to help you decide wherever those routes are going to be, what resources may be, uh, may be impacted. Okay, and let me just uh, alert our uh, listeners that uh, I don't think we're going to have time to take any more questions. So I've got about three more on the queue here that I'm going to try to get to, but uh, at this point it, it probably won't help to type any more in looking at the clock. So here's another one. Regarding enforcement, it seems like there is both a lack of will and a lack of resources. Any ideas how NPS as an agency can improve our enforcement efforts? Uh, um, I'm not too sure about the lack of will. I know for our case uh, we have folks that are dedicated to marine <coughs> patrol, but I think the resources is a, a bigger issue. First of all, you know, my expectation of any park ranger is that they educate first and then they use law enforcement as a tool to remedy the situation if necessary. And that's exactly what my folks do here. It's, it's a large education process, they're extension of the interpretation folks. And then they're also extension of resource management is educating the fishermen what it is that they're doing out there. Um, but we definitely, uh, to do this right, uh, we have got to find other ways to get more people trained to do uh, enforcement or at least get everybody on board to be the eyes and ears for enforcement. <clears throat> but, you know, frankly, you know, most of this is still a misdemeanor and uh, it's got to be done in the presence of a ranger for them to prosecute. Now, the other ways of helping is uh, we have enlisted the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard is very willing to start enforcing uh, marine reserves uh, throughout the state of California, especially when they're around national parks. And they do flyovers for us, uh, I think it's almost once a month. And a lot of times they'll even put a ranger on board and we will have the Coast Guard start to make cases for us. So definitely the enforcement is going to take a partnership with fish and game agencies and the Coast Guard and, of course, our agency. I don't see any new monies coming down for enforcement, so the partnerships are going to be the way to go. Okay, a good answer. Thank you very much. And uh, can you speak a little bit about the difficulty and controversy in establishing these areas 
For example, how long did it take? Was the state of California on board from the beginning? How much resistance was there from the resource extraction interest groups? Uh, there, there, was a, there was a lot of uh, resistance, but again, the resistance was balanced by a lot of encouragement by others to want to. Uh, we're lucky in California that there was a law passed called the Marine Life Protection Act, and it said that they were going to set aside these special areas in the state. So it wasn't a matter of not doing it, it was a matter of doing it. So the important part here is bringing all the stakeholders to the table. We had 65 stakeholders in the Southern California process, and they were broken into three separate groups. And I can tell you, it was a lot of hard work. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. There was a lot of testimony. There was a lot of emotion. But when it came down to it, uh, the groups were able to sit down and forge out something of, a, I would say, a compromise that met the letter of the law. We have a couple of gaps that most of us would like to have seen fixed but we understand that uh, it is a compromise process when you have to involve this many stakeholders. Okay. Um, you have time for a couple more, Russell? Uh, yeah, I have time. Okay. There's uh, one here that says, how is harm defined in Executive Order 13158? Do you... you know, um, I'm not sure how it's defined there. Uh, so I, I just use our park and uh, and I, I focus on unimpairment and I also look at our legislation where it says uh, no adverse negligible impacts and I use our data and sit around with uh, my staff to determine whether we think there's harm so I'm not sure harm is defined I'd have to go back and take a look but to me the organic act is our measuring tool and it's up to us to prevent unimpairment that is our job Okay, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more here. One says, is there any work on the genetic diversity of these marine reserves? Will these be considered refuge populations that could be used to repopulate other areas that have been depleted of overharvested species? Oh, so one of the uh, ideas I didn't talk about is one of the benefits of marine reserves is called spillover. And uh, so what you will start to see, we believe, I don't know if we're seeing it yet, but as these uh, areas uh, do well, of course, some of those animals have to move out. And so that's why people fish the line, by the way, trying to get all those animals that are trying to swim out of the area, is that you will get spillover. Is there a possibility that they become genetic reservoirs? I'm sure that that's a possibility. But uh, we have to remember in the ocean world, uh, larval disbursement is a large, large, large broadcast. And so uh, it's going to be... You know, we need to have these bigger, older fish that produce lots and lots of egg and sperm. They're the one piece of the pie, but we have to have a place for those those uh, larvae to settle and then grow into adults themselves. So, yes, I think they can be uh, genetic reservoirs over time, but let's keep in mind that we do have this big soup out there that's constantly being stirred. Okay, and our final question here, Russell, is on the education side. It says, how do you relate ocean-based science to people who do not experience the ocean except at the beach or in a watershed? And what are some examples of good interpretive and educational efforts directed at land dwellers? <laughs> well, um, you know, I think that our interpretive staff here has done a great job of that, of using media. Um, that last slide I showed you um, a lot of that is made possible because the Interp Division had partnered with the local school district, the Ventura County Office of Education, in which the park provides the content, but the school district provides the backbone of getting that content into the classroom. So that's one way of doing it. Um, there's, and, and I think it's very effective because we can reach uh, hundreds of thousands of people and we can be in multiple classrooms and and what I mean being in the classroom that classroom actually talks to that diver live underwater in real time it isn't a taped broadcast it's a live broadcast with questions coming from the classroom but it's important to have the ranger in the classroom to help facilitate that and there's been other programs we've done here uh, with partnering with the Jason Foundation to bring up these uh, folks we call Argonauts and getting them out there, learning about the ecosystem. But it's, it's all about touching 
new souls and having them start to preach you know the the gospel of the ocean and getting them out there many of our our local neighbors here they have uh, they live by the ocean but they've never put their toes in it okay well I want to thank you once again Russell for your time uh, thanks to all the audience members for uh, tuning in and um, asking such good questions and a huge thanks to John Morris for uh, pushing the button sort of behind the curtain to make this all come together. Um, we'll do another webinar in January. Again, keep uh, your eyes out for the registration link and so forth coming for that. And uh, I really think that's about all I have for today. So thanks again. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Russ.